Mr. McCoy here again with the Egypt game part 14. That was just great as far as the trance was concerned, Toby thought. If anybody could throw a far out fit, April could. And if he hadn't cooked up such a great idea himself, he'd have been tempted to go along with April's version just to see how she'd do it. But the fact of the matter was, he had a scheme that was going to make the oracle bit just about the greatest thing that had ever hit the land of Egypt. So much as he hated to do it, he set about spoiling April's plans. So, when they dropped their questions in the fire, he asked, how are you going to know what to answer? Particularly if you haven't even seen the question. You must not have been listening in class today, April said. I don't have to know. The gods speak through the mouth of the priestess. Sometimes it was hard to tell whether April was kidding or whether she really believed stuff like that. Ken was looking at April in consternation. You really think the gods are... His voice faded away and for a minute he just stared at April. Sheesh! He said at last, you really are cracking up this this time. But Toby only raised an eyebrow and gave April his cute, cool amusement look. Sure, he said, but don't you think we ought to have something else planned? Just in case the gods don't get the message? Then, while April glared at him, Toby told everybody his idea and naturally, everybody thought it was the greatest, even April, after she'd had a chance to cool off. The way Toby saw it, somebody would think up a question they wanted answered about the future. Then they would write it on a piece of paper and bring the paper to the temple of the oracle. At the temple, the priest, or priestess, he added graciously, would pass the paper over the sacred fire and do whatever other stuff he could think up. Then... And this was the good part. He would take it to the special altar that they would build for Thoth and put the question in his beak and leave it there overnight. Toby jumped up and grabbed Thoth down off the shelf and dusted him off. After all, Toby said, Thoth was the Egyptian god of wisdom, and this crazy priestess bit was something the Greeks thought of. That was a good point. And after that, there wasn't much more argument, except that April did say, if they were going to be so particular, how about the fact that actually Thoth was supposed to be an ibis and not an old chewed up owl. But nobody paid much attention to her. They were all too busy starting in on Thoth's altar and planning the ceremony for consulting the oracle. It was decided that they would draw straws and the winner would get to be the first one to ask the oracle a question. They gave the straws to Marshall to hold and everybody drew. And just as you'd think, the winner was Ken, the one guy who really didn't want to win. Sheesh, Ken said. I don't know anything to ask. Anything I can't find out for myself, I don't even want to know. Now look. Toby said, you won and you can't cop out on it. That's poor sportsmanship. Anybody can think of a little old question about the future. I'll bet even Marshall could think up a lot of questions, and he's only four years old. I can think up three bags full, Marshall said. Nobody ever got away with calling Ken a poor sportsman. His chin got the hard look it got just before he slammed a home run, and after a minute you could tell he thought of something because his ears got red. Okay, he said, I got a question. Give me the paper. At that point, Melanie suggested that perhaps the questions to the oracle ought to be written in hieroglyphics, but for some reason, Toby was against it. As soon as Ken had written his question, Toby grabbed the folded paper and, stepping up to the new altar, he started right in being the priest of the oracle. By the time a certain party realized what had happened, she was too interested in what was going on to argue.
Toby pressed the slip of paper to his forehead and walked three times around the temple. Then he made Ken kneel before the altar of Thoth and pressed the paper to Thoth's forehead, while Toby sprinkled them both with holy water from the tuna can. Next, he hung the paper on one of Thoth's long, sharp toenails and sprinkled it with more holy water. Finally, he waved it back and forth in the smoke from the incense burner, chanting, Hear us, O Thoth, ancient and wise. Hear us and answer. There was no doubt about it, Toby made a great high priest. The other Egyptians were so caught up in his smooth solemnity and exalted priestly expression that they found themselves almost believing well, half believing that Toby was actually talking to an ancient and powerful being, and that something strange and supernatural was about to happen. So when Toby turned to them a moment later and thundered, Kneel and bow low, O ancient Egyptians, before the miracle of the oracle, they hurried to obey. A moment later, when they lifted their foreheads from the temple floor, the scrap of paper was hanging in Thoth's curved beak, and Toby was backing away from the altar, bowing at every step. When Toby had backed to where the others were kneeling, he got them up and hustled them out of the temple. Out in the middle of the storage yard, he dropped his high priest expression. In his normal voice, he said, well, I guess we might as well cut out. If we hang around, somebody's going to read what's on Ken's question before tomorrow, and that would ruin everything. April's eyes flattened. Like what, for instance? She asked. Just why, what do you have in mind that might get ruined, Mr. Oracle? Have in mind, Toby said, giving her the wide-eyed, innocent treatment. I don't have anything in mind. I, it's just that I don't want anybody else to either. At least, not until we find out what the Oracle can do all by itself. Wait a minute, Tobe, Ken said, looking worried again. You don't mean you think there's a chance it might. How about what you said before about the gods not getting the message and all that? Sheesh! Sometimes I think the whole bunch of you guys are going off your rockers. Toby gave Ken a reassuring grin. Cool it, he said. I, I don't think anything, at least not anything for sure. I just think we ought to give it a chance. Then if nothing happens, we can take turns being the one who makes up the answers. But what I do think is you never can tell about a thing like this lowered his voice mysteriously. After all, it used to work, didn't it? I mean, all those other oracles weren't just kid stuff. Even kings and generals and all sorts of other adults used to go for this oracle stuff, didn't they? Well, as one person, the six Egyptians turned and looked back into the temple shed. The sun was very low, and the shade was deep in the back of the temple where the new altar to Thoth had been built. The huge tattered owl seemed to be leaning forward, staring into the incense burner. And as they watched, a final twist of fragrant smoke curled upward like a dancing snake and seemed to wind itself around the head of Thoth. Someone moved towards the opening in the fence, the other five followed so quickly that it was almost as if nobody much wanted to be the last one out into the alley. So what do you predict is going to happen at this point? Share with your fellow listener. The next day, by prearrangement, all the Egyptians met in the alley and entered the land of Egypt together. Toby said that it was necessary so no one would have a chance to fool around with the oracle before everyone was there. Once inside the yard, everyone looked at Toby, but Toby looked at April. Okay, Bastet, he said, you wanted to be the oracle princess, so today it's your turn. You can do the ceremony of returning to the oracle for the answer. That is, unless you don't think you can think up a good answer. 
I can think up answers to everything, April said. But I thought you were expecting the oracle to do its own answers. Or did you change your mind? Oh no, Toby said. I didn't change my mind. I just thought you ought to have some good answers ready, just in case. So let's get going. So April took charge. To get everyone in the mood, she got the box of costumes out of the shed and had everyone put something on a headdress or a robe, or at least some jewelry. Then she set the scene. Okay, she said. Coramheb, the famous general, has come on a pilgrimage to the grotto of the Oracle of Thoth to ask a terribly important question. He arrived at the grotto a few days ago and asked his question, and since then he has been fasting in a holy cell while he waits for the answer. You know, people who were going to the oracle had to prepare themselves very carefully. So they usually shut themselves up for days without any food and meditated until they felt very pure and sort of dizzy. And then they were ready to go. So that's what you've been doing, Ken. Ken looked self-conscious and Melanie made a funny smothered sound. April was careful not to catch her eye. She knew that Melanie was trying not to laugh at the idea of solid old Ken being pure and dizzy. April hurried on. The rest of us are priests and attendants of the Oracle, and I'm the High Priestess, who is the only one who can go into the altar room where the Oracle gives out the answers. Next, April had everyone help make some twisted paper logs to burn in the sacred fire bowl and then she lined them all up for a procession to the grotto. Ken was in the middle in the place of honor, and April demonstrated to him how he should walk, with his hands crossed over his chest and his eyes sort of rolled up. April herself led the procession, and when they had gone twice around the yard, she lined everyone up on the edge of the temple. Then she approached the altar alone. First, she lit the candles and the incense and the sacred fire and put the fire bowl on the floor in front of the altar. On the altar, Thoth still sat with the slip of paper in his beak exactly as they'd left him the night before. April bowed low before him and started in on the elaborate ceremony using some of the old things they'd done before and some new ones she just thought up. She walked around the altar backwards three times, sprinkling holy water. She pulled out three hairs from her head and dropped them on the fire. Then she sat down cross-legged between the fire and the altar and began to chant. Melanie sat down too on the edge of the temple floor and motioned for the others to do the same. Aye, aye, e, e, April chanted, making her voice go up and down the scale and along the edge of the temple. The other Egyptians took it up. When the wailing chant was going strong, April suddenly cried, Stop! The mighty Thoth has heard us. The oracle has spoken. So what do you suppose the oracle has to say? Share with your fellow listener. And now, moments more of the Egypt game, very slowly and dramatically. With her eyes half closed and her face smoothed into a dreamlike calmness, April raised her arms above her head and with both hands took the message from the beak of thought. Very, very slowly, she brought it down to eye level and unfolded it. She read it carefully and then turned it over and read the other side. Her calmly regal high priestess expression faded, and she frowned as she read each side again. Then she stood up and stomped out of the temple. The rest of the Egyptians jumped up. Okay, April said, who's the wise guy? Wise guy? What's the matter? What does it say? Everybody was talking at once. What did you write on this paper yesterday? April asked Ken. What was your question? Ken shrugged. Oh, I don't know, he said. Just some dumb stuff or in the, if I was going to be a star in the big league someday. April held out the slip of paper and everybody crowded around to look. 
in large in Ken's large neat handwriting it said will I be a big league star someday yeah that's it Ken said that's what I wrote but then April turned the paper over so the other side was visible in a very different handwriting small and jittery there was written we'll find out what was written on the back of that slip as the Egypt game continues.